there's an intimate and real. Well, this afternoon we take the same great time as it were, and look at that opportunity to love. Now, John uh, mentions love often in the Gospel, when he comes to uh, talk with Nicodemus, and he's talking about how the uh, Son of Man must yet be lifted up, that Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. He said that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But then he adds those wonderful words we can know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. John is the one who likes that. Paul does it, so we're inspired in a very beautiful way. Scarcely for a righteous woman, we may have one guy that God who means his love to us, and the love of the sinners of Christ. And then Christ begins to say, Even cause you might have the tongues of men and angels, but you don't have the love of the dying. So, the New Testament is saturated with that. Um, I think the Apostle Peter, perhaps, in his first letter, uh, he can commend the people for having the very truth. He says he loved more completely, passionately, fervently, with sincere hearts. There is no question that love is the mark of a Christian. Years ago, Francis Schreiber, philosopher, Christian philosopher, wrote a little booklet called The Mark of the Christian, and he picked up on Jesus' words in John 13, 35, I believe it is, by the shalom men and the two mighty disciples. Not that you've got a library full of books, not that you've got graduate certificates from seminaries and colleges. This is what marks out people who love all others as my office, which is God on as, in the same way, part of the same now that I have loved in the youth. And I want to leave you again, perhaps, who knows, it may be the only occasion I get to speak to you. I want to leave you with it again the call of the challenge and the signs to be people who, in the pursuit of Christ likeness, recognize that that which characterizes our Lord and Savior and our Father more than anything else is love and understanding. Now, John, as I mentioned, made his and he has been called, in fact, the Apostle of Love. We have stories that come down that are apocryphal or historical, I'm not quite sure, but stories that come down to us that in his latter days, we understand that the Apostle John spent his latter years in Asia, probably in the province of Asia, modern Turkey. And uh, at Ephesus, when he was too weak and weary, to be able to walk to or attend the gatherings of Christians there, he'd be carried on a blanket. And in the service, he would often be asked, almost not Father John, but <laughs> Father John, they would say, Have you got a word for us? And in his tremendous weakness, he would prop himself up and draw in all the strength.
We were talking about knowing God this morning. And John says here, here is an evidence that you know God. Not know about him. Not read about him in your theological books. Here is an evidence that you know God. Which is love. He puts it the other way around, because they almost have the tinge of warning, and he says, anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. You couldn't have it more emphatic, stronger than that. Are we children of God? Are we born again of the Spirit of God? Are we amongst those children that God is bringing to glory? And we must appreciate that he is inscribing our characters, this quality of love that belongs to him. Jonathan Edwards, the great 18th century revivalist and theologian from America, wrote, uh, wrote a, a book on, uh, on 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and he entitled it, Heaven is a World of Love. Are you longing for heaven? Do you realize that heaven is a place of perfected love? Because that's what it is. Heaven is a realm of perfected love. So John says this, and then he goes on in verse 9, and he, as it were, gives a definition again. Remember this morning, this is eternal life. And he gives this condensed little summary and statement that could be viewed as a definition. Here he's doing something similar. And this is love. You want to know what the love of God is? He says, here it is. In this the love of God was made manifest amongst us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we've loved God. We cannot find the roots and origin of the grace of love in our human conduct or response to God. It's not there. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God has so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Let me just pause in that last little uh, verse, the last statement there for a moment, just to open that up. Another of the great words in John is the word abide. We abide in Christ, Christ abides in us, and so on. It, it, it's across a spectrum of things. But it says, look, if we love one another, God abides in us. It's an evidence that God is dwelling in us. And it says the second part, his love is perfected in us. Now, I love that word perfected. I'm not a Greek scholar. There's people here amongst us today who know more Greek than I do. But in, in Greek, perfection is often connected with the word talos, which has a goal. The idea of a goal, it's reached its end. It's come to its target and purpose. And when I read this, I understand what John is saying. Is that when we love each other, God's great love for us that initiated our redemption and salvation has reached its goal. And it's reached its goal when we become lovers like God is. That's the sort of thing he seems to be saying. Anyway, all of that really is, in a sense, by way of introduction. I want to bring what is often viewed as a rather weak and soft, sentimental and soppy virtue right where it belongs, in the core of the gospel. The motivating force that led God to send his son into the world. 
the motivating force that led the Son of God to lay down his life for us. And it's the motivating force for the lives of Christ likeness and Christ centeredness. Love is important as Christians. And I hope that we all take time to ponder and think today as to how well expressed that virtue and grace is in us. Let's look just firstly briefly at what these verses do teach us about the nature of love. As I've already mentioned, in verse 9, John says, In this the love of God has been made manifest. Paul says a similar thing in Romans chapter 5. God has demonstrated, God has manifested, God has made his love clear to us. Open, manifest. God made manifest amongst us. Here is what the love of God that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might what? Live through him. Here it is. Now, again, when I read this passage, I find the echoes of the Old Testament come back to mind again and again and again. And when I read particularly these words, in this is that God sent his only son into the world to save us. The echo that comes to mind is from the beginning of Genesis 22. <clears throat> you remember God had called Abraham out of her for these. He had uh, at last given after 25 years, as it were, something of that nature, son of his promise, he had caused Ishmael to be sent away, and here Isaac grows into the of the Lord. And then in, in Genesis 22, we read these words, after these things, God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, take your son, now listen to this, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. Now, back in about 1988, the Reformed Baptist churches in Auckland organized a speaking conference to which they invited a very uh, well-known Scottish theologian who's History has been somewhat blemished a bit, but anyway, leave that aside. Brilliant, brilliant thinker, brilliant preacher. And I will always remember him preaching on Genesis 22 in these words. And he began in a very broad Scottish accent, which we could barely understand, saying, whilst this is perhaps not a type, it is an allegory or something, but a, he said, it does help us see into the heart of God. Now, he retold the story of Abraham and Isaac walking up the mount. Remember, they had others with them. They led them with the animals. They burdened themselves with the fire and the wood. And as they're climbing up the mount, Isaac asked the question. He says, Father, Father, he says, Here's the wood, and here's the fire, but where is the sacrifice? And Abraham, that great man, said, God himself will provide the sacrifice. And this theology went on to take us into the scene of the altar being constructed, the wood being laid on it, and then Isaac being bound on it, and the knife being poised above Isaac. There were over 500 people in that audience. Everybody held their breath. Because everybody was caught up in a profound feeling of emotion. His only son, his dearly loved son, to be sacrificed. And in those moments, I think we will all 
given a taste of what John's talking about here. The love of God has been manifest amongst us in that he sent his only son into the world that we should live through him. The cost of him, his only son, his dearly loved son. But even more than that, John doesn't stop at that. He repeats himself again. In verse 10 he says, And this is love, not that we've loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. I'm sure pastor has explained that word to you. Many people today abhor the notion of Jesus offering a propitiatory sacrifice because it has to do not so much with expiating guilt but pacifying and placating and setting aside the just anger of God. God loved us that much that instead of pouring his just wrath upon us, he sent his son to the world in order that he might finish it. That's love. Now, as we ponder what John says here about these things, I think that there are three things that we can learn about love. And we need to be very clear in this because of the confusion that exists. And I'll just pause for a moment before coming to this point. The concept of love, I'm sure, in Zambia has been deeply affected by Western Romanticism, as it certainly has in New Zealand. Love is a term that's sentimentalized, it's emotionalized, and I have to say it, I'm sorry, but eroticized. That, that's what love is. It is primarily an issue of feeling. Again, sharing with the pastor how a 37 year old marriage. Is, is, is crumbling and destroyed because essentially the wife says, I don't feel any love for any longer. That kind of thing's destroying marriages and homes. But there's also another unhealthy concept of love, not just as a matter of good feelings, nice feelings, attractive feelings, pleasant feelings, but there is another problem with love that has arisen in the last 70, 80 years, and that is what Martin Luther would have called the curving back of love from God and others onto self. Let me just pause for a moment to describe or speak very briefly of, I think, a brilliantly written and helpful book that's been published in the last three hundred years. It is called The Rise and Triumph modern self. Have you come across that book? It's uh, the book that's been written, I keep on forgetting the name of the author, here it is, Carl Truman has written that book. Now in that book, he wrote it to try and understand how is it that our society today has reached a point, he had been asked by publishers to write this book, he's a theologian in the United States. How is it our society has reached a point where people can say, I am really a man in a woman's body, or I am a woman but in a man's body? How have we got to that point, he said. And he begins by exploring what some of the key philosophers have been saying about the shift in our whole culture. And one of these philosophers is a Jewish philosopher who said, broadly speaking, if we go back to the Greek civilization, we can identify four major periods in history that have defined and shaped the way people thought of themselves. He says, look, the first period, the Greek period, could be thought of as the realm of political man, where it was the politicians, the senate, the people speaking in the forum, the sophists, the wise people who would come and teach, they were the people that shaped the ideas and thoughts of people as to who they were 
what life was about and what they were to do. The second period of history, he said, was religious man. Now, religious man was man who was shaped by a conviction and belief in God. Christianity was, of course, a major of that, so it was Islam. And people took their identity from a theological, correct or incorrect, understanding of who humans were. The third period, he says, of human history, where people have been shaped by the culture and philosophy, was what he called economic man or industrial man the period of the Industrial Revolution, where suddenly the issue for people became wealth, possessions, and things. And so class structures developed in terms of haves and have-nots. But then he said, there was a radical shift in the middle of the 20th century and the emergence of a fourth kind of human, and that is of human identity, and that is therapeutic man. That's how he described it. Now, therapy has to do, of course, with the treatment of ailments or disorders of one kind or another. And I think many of you will be aware of the fact that in the United States in particular, there was an absolute explosion of what people call shrinks, People would go to psychologists, and the first question that would be asked in trouble was, well, have you been to see a psychologist? But what's important is not so much the name you give to the people trying to assist. What was important in that was a shift. A shift in people gaining identity from something outside of themselves to something inside themselves. Do you follow that? Even under, for example, political man, it was the political theories. It was the Nero's and various others. That, in terms of religious man, of course, it is God. Allah, if you're a Muslim, Yahweh, God, the God and Father of Jesus Christ, if you're a Christian. In industrial man, it's again a notion of possessions equal fulfillment and worth and happiness. Outside themselves. But now, 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 feelings, personal well-being have become ultimate. And so, what we find is, today, the great thrust is you've got to love yourself and look after yourself first. Today, People are using terms like, well, it's my truth. You may believe something different, but, but this is my truth. And that's what matters. And it's me. All, 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 all about me. Friends, you cannot love as God loves and be better. God's love is completely countercultural to look after me, me first. Climb the ladder. Get important, you're totally different. As we look at what John says, there are these three elements that come out very, very clearly. And the first is this it is others rather than self that are the focus in love. What does God do? God sent his only son into the world. Why? So that he could appear so glorious and generous and selfless? No. He did it so that we might have life through him. It is other generated outside of God himself. The love of God is love that expresses itself and overflows from within us outward for the good of others. It is not self-seeking, self-seeking. It is other oriented. The second thing about the love of God, we see here so clearly, is it is not concerned about getting, but giving. And that's, I'm 
using this in terms of modern day terminology with regards to love. If you love me, you will make me happy. That's the kind of cry that you hear again and again. But friends, the love of God is not about getting, but it is about giving. People have tried to speculate a little in terms of what was it that was ultimately the motivation for God creating. And trace it back again to the inherent love life of God, whereby his essential being overflows with a deep desire that his blessedness and goodness should be felt outside of itself. Not, a, not the what he might get, but what he might give. Those are the first two things I think we see about the biblical love. It is not self-orientated, but how it's orientated. The second thing is, it is not concerned about getting, but it is of giving. This is the love of Christ who laid down his life for us. We will also have to lay down our lives for the third. The third thing is, you cannot escape it, is the sacrificial costly character of God. Self-giving in love is invariably costly. I experienced that appreciation in America these past five weeks. I have my little grandchildren there, five under nine years old. To be honest, I wasn't feeling very well during most of my time in America. And I would uh, work on material like this and do lectures in the morning. I'd work in the farm in the afternoon. By five o'clock, I was absolutely exhausted. And my nine-year-old grandson would say, Pa, that's what he calls me, Pa, can you throw the rugby ball, the, the balls in me? Can you do this? I would clean up after the supper of the family. We'd have Bible reading together, read from the little Pilgrim's Progress. Pa, Pa, can you play a game with us? Eight o'clock and Pa's about ready to fall to pieces. And again and again, I was just challenged to preach. Okay, one has to be sensible and times say, okay, it's a no games night tonight. I'm so tired. But you do have to come to the, 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 the self giving for the good and well being of others is a cost of living. And that is the character of the love that's being commanded to us here. It is not having good feelings about people. It is about giving ourselves in whatever way we can for the good of man, even as God gave his own son to us. Now, that is best that I, I can uh, fathom is, is what we see of the nature of love in this passage. Those three things are important, perhaps other things as well. But I want us to spend a few minutes now on the second part of this message, looking at the duty of love. And it's unmistakable here, isn't it? In verse 7, it is stated in the form of a command, Beloved, let us love one another. I mean, there's no, <laughs> you can't have it more simple than that. And then down in the, uh, <clears throat> which one? The 11th verse. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. It is a duty. It is something that we are to do. But I want to put this to you. A couple of things I want to just draw out. I want to put it to you that the duty to love is not simply a duty to engage in loving acts occasionally, but rather it is to become a loving person. Now, I think that this is quite critically important. Some people can be irritable, scratchy, and like porcupines to live with, if you know what porcupines are. But then on other occasions they say, oh, I love you. And they are overflowing in that kind of mushy, sentimental affectionateness. And that's, that's not what it's talking about here. I want to put it 
to you that God's design for you and me is to turn us into people like his son where it is natural for us to love in any situation. To become lovers, great lovers. That's what I pray for myself. I pray that in coming to Zambia, in coming to Africa, that Christ would so live in me that I might be a lover of those that I meet. That my whole personality, my whole character, my whole nature would become one which was not self reactive, self-defensive, self-seeking, but one that automatically looked out of itself. In my years as a pastor, I have encountered numbers of people who have been what we would call in the West wallflowers. They hold back in corporate meetings, you never see them going and looking up, uh, talking to other people, and they tend to be aggrieved and say, well, nobody cares about me in this church, nobody's got anything for me to do, and over time I've just come to see that the very first step to becoming fruitful in the service of the Lord is to move towards people instead of waiting for them to move towards us. Shyness and reserve can often be marks of love of self gone wrong. How we need to pray, Lord, help me to get beyond myself to see other people, to be interested in other people, to be concerned for other people. I read once of a man saying, Christians are often like little American boys who have their heroes on television in baseball. Now, just the other night when I was in America, I, I, I've been to a baseball game in St. Louis in 1982. It's the only time I've ever seen baseball play. And I was at such a distance from the mound and everything, I couldn't see what was happening. Anyway, there was a World Series going on at the moment. And I said to my brother and son in law, I said, Look, I'd just love to, to, to just see the skill level of some of these things. And they had real close ups. And the pitches were astonishing. I was absolutely amazed with their splitters and fast balls and curve balls and all the rest of what they could do with that ball at 97 miles an hour. Just amazing. Anyway, this author said, many, many young Americans glue themselves to their favorite pitches. They begin to imitate their actions and they go out into a junior baseball game and they try to imitate their hero, and it falls flat. He said, they do not realize that the skill with which a seasoned professional baseballer pitcher pitches is the fruit of many, many, many hours of training. Conditioning the body, improving, learning. He says, you know, many of us Christians are like that. Oh, we read about the importance of loving those who strike us. We read about those who speak evil of us. And we imagine that in the moment, we can suddenly become great lovers like Christ. Just like a boy who's never exercised himself to become strong to throw a baseball thinks he can pitch like a hero. Friends, we must realize that the calling to love and the cultivation of the spirit of love is something that happens in the ordinary each and every day. Will I tell my nine-year-old grandson, Pa is too tired, forget it, let me sleep. Or will I push myself? Reasonably, and he understands so that he's not manipulative, but to serve and love him. It is that kind of discipline exercised in the ordinariness of a day. When a husband gets out of bed in the morning, perhaps, 
or his wife may be before him. And he deliberately and intentionally inquires after her what she's doing, how she's feeling, what she would like. Friends, we are able to train ourselves by the grace of God in dependence upon the truth and spirit of God to become people more like Jesus. Exercise yourself unto godliness, Paul wrote to Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, verse 7. He uses a word that's used in the gymnasium. And he's saying, just as people today will work irons and weights and all the rest to get perfect bodies, you, as followers of Jesus Christ, you, Timothy, particularly, you are to exercise yourself, discipline yourself, rely on the grace of God, the corporate life of God's people, to become a godly man, a godly woman, somebody who is a lover of other people. I encourage you to do that, brothers and sisters. As I said, in the early years of the reform movement in New Zealand, in our zeal, we were often more theoretically and theologically and doctrinally concerned than we were about what was happening through our actions and words in the lives of other people. We were wounding them, and we were hurting them. And if I were to ask those people, do you feel safe around us? I'm talking about the others. They would probably say, if I want to run a mile. It has been in my days, and I don't think this is compromise, it has been one of the greatest encouragements to myself to hear young Christians, to hear Christians from different theological and spiritual backgrounds come and say, Denver, we feel safe. And why is that? Not because they know I will never correct them, but they will know that I am much more concerned with their souls, their well their growth in Christ, than I am about myself, about my arguments, or even, to say, just about my version of the truth. So I do earnestly urge and ask you and to encourage you. Live lives of love. Do you remember? That's how Paul uh, begins what we have as the fifth chapter of our book of Ephesians. After going through what we have to put off, etc., what we need to put on, he just says, Therefore, be imitators of God and walk in love. Some of the translations have it. Live a life of love. Let the characteristic conduct of all lives be that of love. Now I want to put it to you that it is practical and possible for love to become a guiding, motivating call upon your life. I have gone through and am still going through a season of change in life. We do have seasons in life. I'm in age and stage and situation. And uh, being of a rather nervous temperament and character and loving to know where I'm going and what I'm doing, it's a bit of a challenge sometimes when you're not sure of a road ahead. Two years ago, I was on a retreat in this own island. And very early in the morning, as I was talking to the Lord about this, I had a train of thought come to mind, which I wrote down, and it says this, God's calling for me is to serve others in love in any way that I can to meet real needs as I have been able to get this easy. Friends, that is a powerful modus operandi. My son-in-law in America has just finished his PhD He's doing postdoctoral work, he's unsure of the future, and his friends talk about all sorts of possibilities, and yet he gets more confused, more uncertain. I said to Aaron, I shared with him this, and I said, above all things, surrender yourself afresh to God to live a life of love with the gifts, calling, family, and resources that you have, and he will take you 
guide you and use you in words that fulfill the humanity that he has made you to be. And that's what I would encourage. But let me just end by saying this. Living a life of love, whereby we are dead ultimately to our own personal welfare, advancement, and self-interest and reputation. One of the very hardest things is to love others who are dredging your reputation into the mud. The only way we can do that is to have ultimate, total security in God. He is my spirit. He is my love. He is my righteousness. We can only afford to invest our lives in the welfare of others when we are completely confident that God has our welfare totally in his heart and mind. That enables us to let go of all self-effort and ultimately self-reliance. You know, Christian life is full of upside-down paradoxes. Things that just don't seem to make sense in the world and even to our logic. And one of them Jesus repeated more than once is this. If you want to find your life, you have to lose it. If you want to keep your life in this world, you will lose it. If you hate your life in this world, you will find it. Now that's crazy in terms of the world. But it is true in the kingdom of God. Bill Hybels has written a book which he called Descending into Greatness. It's based on Matthew 20. And there you'll know Jesus when you're speaking to James and John, their mother Salome came saying, when you enter your kingdom, let one of my sons be on your left hand, one on the right hand, and so on. And Jesus said, it's not like that in my kingdom. In the kingdom of the Gentiles, those that are mighty lord it over other people, but not you. In the kingdom of God, the greatest is least of all, and servant of all. And I always picks that up, and he uses that amazingly, I think, very, very receptive and helpful time. Descending into greatness in the kingdom of God. We become like Christ as we lose our lives and give them for the sake of well-being of others and the kingdom. Okay, here's my last word. Often, as I'm leaving to travel overseas, I turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and read what Paul's words where he says that Christ leads them about in triumph. And God makes them a fragrance of life, both to those that will live and those who will die. Now, yesterday, again, telling you lots of things that are current, yesterday, at one point, I pulled the booklet out of the seat, back of the seat of, of the airplane I was traveling in, and it was a book that was giving you the, the duty-free kind of things you could buy. Now I started at the back and I flipped forward and I was amazed that nearly half of that book, nearly half of that book advertising duty-free products was talking about what? What do you think? Perfumes. Perfumes and fragrances. For women, of course, but for men too. Smell right. And when I close that, I say, Lord, Lord, fill me with your spirit of love and grace and let that be the fragrance that is your father by your hands. I put that to you. Calling to live a life of love. That's what it means to be a Christ follower above everything else. Dying to yourself. Laying down your life. That you might live well being of others good. Let's pray for church. Father, we want to thank you for the truth.
tremendous sense of safety that knowing your love for us gives us. Nothing can snatch us out of your hand. How we long and pray that you would make us into great loves. Oh, not at the compromise of truth. Not watering down those things which are true and right and essential, but knocking us off our pedestals of self-interest and self-seeking and self-reliance, that we might in dependence upon you give our lives for the good of you. O oh Lord, turn us into great lovers, and may there be from this assembly a special kind of fragrance, the fragrance of Christ, who gave himself for.